my name is Sarah Corbett and I run the Global Craftivist Collective. I started doing craftivism about 10 years ago, or just over 10 years ago. My background in activism, I grew up in a low income area, my mum's a politician, we always campaigned on local and global issues, and then I worked for big NGOs. And I got into craft because I suddenly found that it slowed me down, it calmed me down, and it helped me think more clearly. And I thought this could be a really useful tool for activism. So that was my journey into it 10 years ago. And then I've honed my craft in craftivism to see where it's helpful, where it's not helpful. I'm really proud to say it has helped change laws and business policies and hearts and minds. Yeah, the plan was never to create a global craftivist collective community and um, but I started doing projects and then friends and family and colleagues in the campaign and world were asking me what I was doing so I shared it online on a blog and then literally within six months I had people all over the world asking to join in the projects wanting to set up their own groups so there was a real demand from people whether it was burnt out activists or introverts or people who love craft and wanted to, to use it for a social purpose um, and it's hard to say no when people want to improve the world. So I suddenly was like, OK, there's a want and a need for this um, and my background in activism. So I knew I could bring strategy to it. So it was effective. Um, but it's happened very organically in the most lovely way. So I always say to anyone that you can be a really effective craftivist, whether you're new to craft or whether you're an experienced crafter. I learned to craft from YouTube, so if I can do it, anyone can do it. All of my projects are online um, and you can find it with little videos and then I have kits for people if they need them and you can do it on your own or in a group. So you can do it on your armchair without telling anyone or you could do it with a group of friends. Um, everything's on the website to have a go and sort of see where it takes you really on your own journey. So I always say craftivism is one tool in the activism toolkit. I still sign petitions and go on some marches if they have a clear strategy and they're not hateful. Um, lots of, I still have boring meetings with politicians, but the handicraft of making something small and beautiful and delicate with a few mistakes that's clearly taken you hours to do it's really hard for a politician or a business leader to forget getting this unusual gift and um, especially if it's got a clear strategy of what you're trying to ask them to change and how they can be part of it it's something so memorable it's tactile Everything I do is linked in with psychology and neuroscience from the colours we use to the textures to the fonts and all of those elements turned into something handmade and small to give to someone to encourage them to be on the right side of history. It's so powerful but you don't really notice it until you experience it, until you've seen it in other people or you've experienced it directly. There's so many examples and I'm really proud that what we do works. I wouldn't do what I do if it didn't work. So we've helped change a law in Spain to protect migrant birds where people gave beautiful origami birds with messages on to politicians in government and made this beautiful installation outside um, and that changed the law. Um, and we had politicians come outside to collect their birds and take them back to the office. I have people all over the world who make handkerchiefs for their senators, their politicians, local councillors, lots of different people to build a long-term relationship with them. So it says, don't blow it, use your power for good. We know you've got a hard job to do and we want to encourage you to, to do the best job. And then you link that into lots of issues you care about because it's more about long-term change. Um, so there's a real, there's so many different ways, which is why I wrote a book all about it. <laughs> Well, 
useful for me. There's lots of different elements of where craft can be useful in activism. So the process using a repetitive hand action, whether it's paper craft or either it's sewing, specifically with text, the process really helps you slow down, calm down and be more mindful and more thoughtful in what you do. So you're not reacting out of anger. You're using the process to think about what am I trying to change? Who is involved in that? Whose mind do I need to change? Who's got the power there? What, is it a law I'm trying to change? Is it a behavior? It gives you that time to think really clearly about your strategy and plan it really well. And then the product is what's happening with this. Is this a piece of street art to provoke passers-by? Or is it something that's more about engaging the media or social media? Or is it about something completely secret between yourself and a power holder to build a relationship with? Um, so the process really helps you think through what is this, why am I making it, who is it for, what will engage them, what language. And then the object is a catalyst for, for change. Um, it's not the conclusion, it's the start of being part of that change you want to see in the world. But it can take time um, and that's why you need to slow down and think carefully about it and make something gentle um, and strategic. So with the Crafters Collective, it engages people of all different backgrounds, different ages, different faiths. I love it for that reason. I think particularly with young people when so much of their life is online and we know that that's not great for our mental health, it's an incredible tool to slow down, get off the blue screen and use your hands, which we know from neuroscientists and clinicians how good it is for our mental health. Um, but also all of the resources I use, I practice what I preach. So I make sure that everything's ethical, everything's as environmentally friendly as possible. We don't use resources if we could use less amounts. Um, and what I love, especially with young people, is when they say, where's this felt made? I can say it's made from post-consumer plastic bottles or where's that fabric from? I can say it's upcycled from donations. So it's a great way for people to not only use the process to help them on their journey, but also really question where they're source and everything and can we do it more sustainably? Um, and I find that fascinating. And the people I work with all over the world of all ages, now more than ever people are talking about how can we be more sustainable in what we do and, and find unusual ways to use resources. So I love fashion <laughs> um, and I felt as an activist in lots of activist groups that I wasn't really allowed to like fashion and I know that the fashion industry is something that we can change often quite much quicker than governments and policies and um, consumers have a lot of power quite quickly especially with social media and fashionistas talking about what they care about so a lot of people engage in craftivism because they love fashion they love textiles and they're naturally a very influential audience with the fashion industry so i've done projects to support fashion revolution where we've had our paper craft mini fashion statement which are these mini scrolls that you shop drop into pockets of of clothes that you think could be more ethical and we managed to get that on the home page of the bbc news website a double page spread in the guardian we got it on very influential websites within the fashion industry and i think that was because it was coming from people who love fashion and we were saying that we love fashion but we want the process to be as beautiful as the final product and that meant the message spread out more everything we did was beautiful <laughs> all of the colors we used we used purples and turquoises the text we used was very elegant and graceful and i think the aesthetic really helps in craftivism that what you're making is small and beautiful and gentle rather than big brash and ugly means that you can engage that people who love aesthetics who do in the fashion industry often more than if you screamed at them with a megaphone and said demonizing or judgmental things um, but you can do craftivism in a demonizing judgmental way so it's really seeing the strengths and the weaknesses and saying okay what can we use that would engage that audience in a different way um, and thinking as carefully as possible on how to do it. Anyone 
you can be a craftivist, whether you love craft or not. I always say that craftivism is a tool in the activism toolkit. So it's not a movement. We don't have a petition movement. We don't have a march movement. But when you see an injustice and you think, okay, how can I be part of solving that? I want you to sort of metaphorically open up that activism toolkit and say, what do I need to do? Do I need to just challenge my neighbour who said something xenophobic? Or do I need to make a mini scroll to reach people online? But I really want people to see craftivism as a really valuable tool in the activism toolkit. And at certain times, it's the best one to pick up. And at certain times, it's not the best one to pick up. So it's really there to help people be effective change makers um, in different ways. It's really hard to pick issues that you care about because I care about everything <laughs> and most people do. And that's why you have to be strategic. So I have to think very clearly about as a white woman from Liverpool, living in London, where's my influence? Where can I be of use? You know, I run this global craftivist collective. I know that we can have a lot of influence within the fashion arena from what we've discussed about the aesthetics and the type of audience we have. I also know that I can't solve the war in Syria um, so I can give emergency relief. But I think what's great with some of our projects, like the workshop we did today, it was about how you can be the most effective change maker you can be within your context, within your contacts that you've got, using the different skills and talents you've got, where is it, where can you be of best use on different issues and it might be that you really care about one issue but you've got more influence on another issue and that's not um, being cold, that's being strategic on where can you be of best use without burning yourself out and it's a hard balance. So I have a tattoo on my shoulder from Martin Luther King saying you need a tough mind and a tender heart. So you need a tough mind to think strategically about where you can be of best use but you need that tender heart of how can I do what I do in a loving way, knowing that I can't do everything, but I can try and be a good jigsaw piece in the puzzle. If I had to pick one person that inspires me the most in my general protest work, it would be Martin Luther King Jr. I still read his book of sermons and lectures all the time, and the more I read them, the more I see how everything he did was based on emotional intelligence, he refers to philosophers and different religious leaders and everything's about strategy, but it's all wrapped up in love, which sounds very hippie, but highly strategic, very sensitive about what he did. He knew when to do big media stunts. He knew when to have very quiet conversations with presidents. And so he constantly inspires me. So I'm always thinking, what would Martin Luther King do? But with a bit of thread. <laughs> So I believe that if we do want to make the world a more beautiful, kind and just place, then our activism should be more beautiful, kind and just because it makes more sense and it would be more strategic. And it sounds cheesy, but it's days like today where you're just with a group of people stitching away with lovely lavender smells, a cup of coffee, having a chat about how we can make the world a better place locally, nationally, internationally and seeing the beauty in the world, whether it's raining or not, and saying, how can we have even more beauty in the world? That's what keeps me going, is seeing all the great stuff and how we can make things more great, rather than just focusing on all the problems where you then can't think of anything because you're in a downward spiral. So I'm always reminding myself of the beauty in the world, in people, in colours, in smells, in a good coffee, that keeps me going to want to make the world a more wonderful place. Mm -hmm.